Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of All Ball Chicago. I'm your co-host, Robert Bobby Reed, and I got the legend and the host, Marcus Liberty, on the line. But we got a special guest in the building today. We got one of the NBA 50 greatest players, one of the only players to lead the league in scoring, uh, ABA in scoring, uh, college in scoring. Rick Barry, what's up, big baby? Hey, I'm hanging in there. Like you said, taking it one day at a time, like my father used to say, under these crazy times that we're going through. I mean, God, I don't think anybody ever envisioned something like this ever taking place in their lifetime. It's kind of crazy. Hopefully everybody's staying healthy and we'll just follow the directions that we have and, you know, stay inside. And if you go out, put a freaking mask on and let's just get this thing under control so we can get back to some sort of normalcy. I mean, this is crazy. No NBA going on. No sports going on. It's uh, I'm tired of looking at all these damn reruns, although I have a lot of people calling me because they're putting a lot of stuff that I was involved in. Hey, I just saw you on TV. I said, yeah, well, when was that? From what, 20 years ago? <laughs> hey, let me tell you something about Chicago, first of all. Okay. Because Chicago, when I played, it was unbelievable. They hated me in Chicago for 1975 because everybody thought the Bulls were going to be able to be the champions, right? And they were going to win in the West. And we knocked them off in seven games. And I was so freaking happy when they finally go ahead and they got the title and they got Michael and you're able to win because people then forgot about me. And so, you know, now I had a lot more, you know, a nice, nicer reception in Chicago when I used to go back there, but before they freaking hated me. <laughs> wow. So, so Rick, you, you're telling me that you were a bad man then, right? So no, I was you... just telling you that Marcus, if I went out there, I didn't go out to make friends with you. I'm going to have to kick your ass. <laughs> okay. I, you. I, I mean, it wasn't out there to go ahead. This is not a social event where I'm trying to become friends with you and figure if we can go out to dinner or something. I'm going out there to beat you, okay? So, and I'm going so to beat you as badly as I could beat you. I will show you no mercy whatsoever because that's what sports is about on the professional level. You're getting paid to win, not getting so, paid to make friends. And I see these guys going out there hugging each other before the game. Hey, save the hugs for after the game, off the court, away from what you're doing. So that was gonna that was gonna that was, that was gonna lead to that question. Like, what do you see the difference in this era and then in your era when you was playing? But you well, just the difference is the players player. when I played knew how to play. I think Ooh. one of them, I think players, younger players are getting shortchanged a lot in this. I'm not a big fan of AAU basketball. Okay. I think that you know, not all programs are bad, but I think a majority of them don't really teach the game the way it should be taught. And the problem is is that young kids they get somebody who sees this great athleticism and, you know, there's so many incredible athletes out there, potential, but the potential to be really great at something athletically. And unfortunately the first person that gets it might be their father or a friend of the family or somebody who really doesn't know the game that well. And they just let them go out there and use their unbelievable natural talents and skills to excel. And they can excel. I mean, come on, Marcus, you know, as well as I do, there are guys in the NBA right now that are there on their sheer athleticism who have no idea how to play the damn game the right way and are making millions of dollars and they'll never be as good as they should be because they weren't given the fundamental foundation to build on. I equate it to that. You can't build a skyscraper with a small foundation. It'll go so high and it's going to topple over without that foundation. So in sports or anything you do in life, whether it's music, whether it's science, whatever it may be, you have to learn all of the fundamental principles and concepts of that endeavor to give yourself the biggest foundation possible so you can put the tallest building on it. And this way you can maximize the full potential that God gave you the, the ability with, you know, to have at birth. And then hopefully with some guidance from the right types of coaches to maximize that potential. You see, Marcus, I love, I love greatness. I love watching people who are great. I, I have great admiration regardless of what the, the field of endeavor is. And I really get so disappointed. Like when I coached in the minor leagues, I had some kids, Marcus, they were, they could, this one guy could have been a Michael Jordan type guy and maybe better. He had a, he was Michael Jordan size height wise, but bigger and stronger. Right. And he was then one of the nicest kids ever had the greatest attitude, wanted to stay after practice, wanted to do stuff, but he had no idea how to play. I oh. couldn't, I couldn't even play him because he didn't understand the game. It was such a shame, and he had two kids already. And I said, look, I, I feel so badly. If I could have had my hands on you when you were younger, you'd be in the NBA today, you'd be a big superstar. Because he had, the, he had everything going for him. Good-looking kid, unbelievable attitude. I love this kid. I couldn't play him because he didn't know how to use this amazing gift that he was given. And when I see that, it just broke my heart. 
And that happens all the time in sports. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. So who was one of the guys with, that helped you when you were little, when you were learning the game? Who my taught father. you? My Your father was a semi-pro player and coach. And so it was all fundamentals. If I didn't do something fundamentally right, I asked was on the bench. <laughs> so I learned how to do stuff, you know, run backwards, see ball, man relationships, screen off the boards, all the fundamental things, you know, dribble with the right hand, left hand. Hell, I talked about me when I played. I was like the first point forward. But I would bring the ball up the floor after a rebound and dribble it right hand, left hand, do a crossover. That was the extent of my dribbling skills. I could dribble righty, lefty, and do crossovers. And they were all raved about, you know, what a good ball handler I was because I was very quick. I was quicker than our guards. I, I was quick and fast. And so that was the advantage that I had at my size. But, you know, if I were playing today, the only part of the game that I would have to – well, two parts of the game I would have to be better for, for me with the standards that I set for myself – I would have to be a better ball handler. I would have to learn to do the through the legs behind the back. Not that I would utilize it all the time, because I think a lot of times it's overdone. But the more I could do with that ball, and if I had those skills and abilities, I would be able to do more things and create more opportunities for myself. Because the thing is, is when you're dribbling the ball, you're not as effective as you are when you have the ball in your hands. Right. And that's what I try to tell people. Too much is done off the freaking dribble. If I have the ball and I get the ball on the wing and I'm looking at my guy to see how I want to attack him, it's not the dribble. Because I always tell people, look, if I just dribble the ball and my teammate's guy that's guarding him turns his head and he cuts to the basket, which he should do, and I just dribbled the ball, how the hell am I getting the ball to him? I don't even have it in my hands. I just missed the golden opportunity to get an easy basket, throw a lob pass or something. Whereas when I got the ball, I had it in my hands. My first dribble was always a productive dribble, or tried to be, where I'm going to use it to get – I don't have to get by my guy. Marcus, you can appreciate this. You only need the guy in your shoulder. That's right. You, know, you just got to get even with him. If you get even with him, you own him. I mean, he's, he's done. You don't have to get by him. And, you know, and if you get by him, well, then forget it. It's all over. I knew I, can get, I can get to or by my guy guarding me. But my problem was is I didn't have the ability to jump over the second guy that came. These guys now can freaking jump over the second guy. I wish the hell I had that skill in my arsenal. I, really, I got two sons that could do that. My youngest son, Canyon, and my son, my son Brent, who could jump out of the gym. You know, yeah. Brent's still the only white guy to win the slam dunk contest. And uh, my other son, Canyon, has like a head of 40-inch vertical, and he could jump out of the gym. Hey, wow. and so it's, it's one of those things that you just have to understand how to utilize it properly. So that would be the one thing, the ball handling. And the other thing would be, I would want to be a better three-point shooter because the three-point shot wasn't part of my game. I mean, because it wasn't even part of the game until I got later into my career in the pros. And I was, I got to be a 33% shooter, which is equivalent to 50 from twos, which is okay shooting. Damn. But to me, I wouldn't be happy unless I was 40%. I think 40, if you're a 40% three-point shooter, now you're a really good shooter. And my goal would be 40 or better for sure. That's what I would have strived for. So if I were to come back today and could come back and had a magic genie or somebody maybe 30 years old again, <laughs> those are the two areas of the game that I'd spend time working on. And all it is is just putting the time and the effort into it to get better at it. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rick, who, who's the best player in the NBA right now? No, you can't go. See, everybody does that. Why do people do that, Robert? That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. Come on. Come on. There's, there's okay. no such thing. In a team sport, there's no such thing as the best player in that sport. It's the okay. best player at his position. Oh. I mean, the same position. That Marcus is, can't be compared to me. He was a guard. Right. Right? I'm a forward. Even though we handle the ball, there's some similarities. The overall skills required to play those positions, they're more similar in the three outside guys. But, you know, a four-man and a five-man, their skills are different. I mean, you can't compare me. I mean, so you're going to compare LeBron James or Michael Jordan or, or, or any of these guys to Will Chamberlain? No. Yeah. But people want to say he's the greatest ever. Hey, people seem to forget. In the center position, nobody's done what Will Chamberlain did. I don't care. You can pick any other center you want to pick, and we'll go here and pick it apart right now. And there's no way they can compare to Will Chamberlain. There's no way. I mean, I love Akeem Olajuwon. I mean, he's more like a power forward and stuff. But even then, now he'd have to shoot the three because the fours all want to shoot three point shots. And many games in the NBA, he's not even a center on the court. I mean, you're playing with with guys that are wingmen and guards. You're not even playing wow. with a center anymore half the time. And so, but Will Chamberlain, when you think about what he did, I mean, his greatest Kareem was the single greatest individual, non-stoppable, unstoppable shot in the game, Kareem Skyhook. Yeah. I mean, that, that, people have no idea how difficult that is. But he was unbelievable with that. And, you know, the dunk, I don't even clue is a shot. That's not a shot. If you could jump, you could dunk. What, the hell, what skill was that? <laughs> no big deal. But the Skyhook, that's a whole new world. That's, yeah. that's unbelievable, the Skyhook. But Wilt had a fadeaway bank shot. 
Will could do the little dip, you know, little finger roll stuff to do it. Will was unbelievable. The guy, first of all, 50 points a game. Marcus, come on. Wow. 50 freaking <laughs> points a game for an entire NBA season. They say records are made to be broken. That one will never, never ever, be ever be broken. Never will happen. I mean, I thought to myself, wait a second, I have to score, let me see, 13 more points a game for 82 freaking games to average 50 points a game. Uh, that's because some guys can't, they can't, most guys don't average 13 points a game for the whole game, right. let alone right. adding 13 to 37, you know, to get to 50. Right. So that's insane. Then you look at his rebounding numbers, 22.5 rebounds per game for his Ooh. career, career. So, and then they didn't keep block shots back then. Can you imagine the block shots and the changes that he made for people inside? Yes. So you, you, you just can't, and the strength that he had, oh my God. I mean, there's stories about him that are just insane. I mean, this is probably the best one that I heard. Okay. A guy named Gene Wiley played for the Lakers. So Wiley, Wilk goes up to go for a two-hand dunk. And Wiley comes over his back and puts his hand over his head into the ball, gets it, and pulls it back out, and everybody goes nuts, right? What? So after the game, when they go up to him, he said, I would like to please make sure you put this in print because I want to make sure that Mr. Chamberlain understands this. I want to thank Mr. Chamberlain for allowing me to take the ball out of his hands on that dunk when he was going up. He said, because if Mr. Chamberlain had decided to dunk the ball, he would have broken my arm in half on the rim because he knew how strong he was. If Wilt had gone with two hands and his arm was there, his arm would have hit the freaking right there on the rim and it would have broken off. And it would have been an ugliest thing you might've ever seen. Almost worse than, worse than Joe Thibes with the bone coming out of his leg in football. Wow. I mean, that's how strong he was and the respect that players had for him. And he's right. Wilt, if he had been, you know, just create, he, he would have just, he would have ruined his life. His career is over. And he let him take the ball because he knew if he went forward, he's going to break his arm in half. So he let him off so the that's, hook. That's the kind of strength that Wilt wow. had. I mean, he could hold, I heard, 300 pounds out in front of him like that. <laughs> he, was, he was crazy. I mean, just unbelievable. Well, I have somebody that wanted me to ask you a question uh, because you shot your, you know, your jump shot overhead, and, but you shot your free throws underhead. So they wanted to ask, why did you – shoot your free throws like that. Well, that's the way my father did it when he played. And, uh, and back then they shot two hand set shots and then they shot underhanded free throws. And so he was trying to get me to do it when I was got to high school. And I don't even remember if it was before my junior year or senior year, but I, I, uh, I, I said, look, I just want to get him off my back. I said, okay, let's do this. Cause he was driving me freaking nuts. And thank God that he did be, you know, it was relentless. And so I really gave it a sincere effort. And as I started doing it, I said, wait a second, shit, this is pretty damn good. I mean, I'm at a natural position with my arms hanging straight down. It's a softer shot. And now a physicist have done all kinds of stuff on this testing and stuff and said it is the, without question, the most efficient way to shoot a free throw. Less moving parts, softer shot. They all say that's the best way to do it. But people, because of their egos, whatever, who the hell cares what you look like? Right. Isn't going the end in. result, is it going in? And how yeah. often is it going in? And right. so... You know, that's how it started. And I shot over eight. I was like a 75% free throw shooter. And then I got to 80. And then I kept getting higher, higher. And then I got the 90s. In my last six years, I changed this technique a little bit. I used to do this, that. Uh -huh. And now I changed it and just did this. Uh -huh. And so I took the wrist out of it. And the last six years, I shot over 92%. My last two years, I shot over 94%. In fact, Andre Drummond from the Pistons, I think three seasons ago, missed 23 free throws in one game. <laughs> 23 free throws in one game that's more free throws than i missed in my entire last two seasons wow <laughs> so i brag i brag about this because it's the only part of the game and you can appreciate this i'm sure marcus and robert you know the game where you can be selfish and help your team yeah mm -hmm. well well man i used to watch that i was like man how is he making those shots but then like you said if you put the, the time hey, in, i missed i that, missed, I missed 10 in one season and nine in another season, my last two years. And I was mad 19 times, let me tell you. Wow. I, I was so upset with myself every time I missed the free throw. I, the only reason I missed it is because I did something technically wrong. Wow. Wow. And so I was very upset with myself 19, but fortunately only 19 times during that season, those two seasons. So, so wow. tell me this. How did, so you come from a basketball family because now – you, your dad was on you, and then you had, what, two, three sons play five. in the NBA? 
Five. Five. I've had five. five sons. Yeah, the five sons have gotten Division One college scholarships. All five have played professionally. My son Scooter, my oldest boy, was the last cut by the Celtics. And back then, they only had twelve man rosters. They had thirteen no cut contracts. Bird and McHale both told me, "said Rick, your son should have made our team. He was better than our number one pick. He never got the chance. He wound up playing overseas until he was forty years old." He still plays now in his 50s. He can still dunk. He's over 50, and he can still dunk. He plays in those club leagues, you know, that they have, that uh, some wow. of the sports clubs. And so he can still play. And then my youngest son, Canyon, is actually on the G League team, but he was on the World Cup World Cup 3x3 gold medal winning team last year. It was the only gold medal the USA never won in basketball, and they, they went undefeated in Amsterdam. And he's on the qualifying team for the Olympics, which hopefully he'll, they'll have an opportunity to do that, and uh, they'll have that tournament coming up to be postponed. And then... Hopefully they'll get either third, second, or first. If they do that, then they qualify for the Olympics, and hopefully he'll get to be an Olympian. But, uh, you know, he should be, I think, in the NBA. He's on on the G League team now, and his stats shooting-wise in all three categories, free throws, three-pointers, and two-pointers, are better than the two two-way guards that they had from the Minnesota team. But, you know, they this uh, he's never gotten the opportunity to get called up and do that. But, see, life is funny. You know, everything happens for a reason. Had he gotten called up one time, he never would have been eligible to be a World Cup champion in wow. 3x3 because they wouldn't taken guys from the NBA. Mm-hmm. They would let the guys come from the G League, but not if a guy had NBA experience, he's not eligible to have played on that team. So, you know, life works in funny ways. And so that's the way it is right now. And, and hopefully he'll have an opportunity to, to, to experience that and be a, and be a, uh, an Olympic gold medalist. Who knows? We'll see what happens, but we'll see. Now, he, now that son that you just mentioned, he's the one shot the free throws like you, right? He shoot, yeah, he did. He shot when he was in, when he played, every place he played, he, he averaged 20 points a game in two places overseas. And then he averaged 30 a game in China. And I mean, but he was in China. He was, he was, this is crazy. In China, he was 60, 40, 90. What? Yeah. 60, 40, 90, 60 from twos, 40 from threes, 94. Wow. The line. Yeah, he needs to be in the league, man. Definitely and, needs well, to be in well, the league. Well, Chris, Chris Mullins saw him playing the three-on-three three thing. He was on the committee and stuff, and he texted him. He said, Rick, he said, I just saw your son play. He said, I had no idea he was that good. He said, he does everything a coach could possibly want. I said, yeah, well, then help me get him in the NBA where he belongs. Exactly. He said, I agree with you. He belongs there. But for some reason, he's not getting the chance to to, to do that. I mean, but – you know, life is funny. I mean, you just deal with, and he deals with it exceptionally well. And we'll see what happens. He's still young enough to get there. I mean, you you can play now till you're 35 or more. I mean, all the physical stuff that they have. I mean, the training and the technology involved. Everything's so sports specific. Wouldn't you agree, Marcus? That if you can go back now and play with all of the training that they have, how much better you would be? I tell people they say, "Oh, you couldn't play with these guys." I say, "Are you out of your mind?" I say, "I'd be faster, stronger, quicker." More endurance, jump higher. I mean, it's uh, the eating, everything else there. We, we used to have steak freaking before a game. That was part right. of the meal. I mean, now they carbo load. And then, you know, we used to travel and have to go ahead and get done with the game, get to sleep at two in the morning, get up at six to catch a commercial flight to get to the yep. next city. And then I'd go to the shower. I'd have to wash my shower, my, my, my uniform in the shower, hope that it dried out before the game the next day. I mean, these guys never touch their uniforms. I mean, it's like a different world. We'd go out after the game. We had cars. We had to drive our Stumps around in the city and go find the place that was open. And my per diem the first year of my league was eight dollars. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm still my Marcus. I mean, because you're you're a lot younger. I mean, you, right. you were spoiled rotten, and the guys now are even more spoiled. Yep, I agree. I agree. Yeah, and I said, well, in the locker room. I mean, come on, you. Go, oh, should I take a steam, a sauna, a whirlpool? <laughs> hey, we went. I hope that I had hot water and I, you know, soap, and that I didn't have a foot fungus that I caught in the shower. <laughs> Wow, man, that is crazy. But but a lot of times people, like young athletes, they don't appreciate things, man. And I think you telling that story, and, and we're going to share this with our uh, listeners, that, man, take don't take a lot of this stuff for granted, man, that you have that's given to you. Put the work in. A lot of kids don't work It's the world of entitlement in. now. It's the world of entitlement. And my father always said, son, the only thing in life you're entitled to is what you earn. Yeah, That's what you're entitled to. Hey, but this coronavirus, but this coronavirus has even put super rich folks in check. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you're talking about something that's had an impact on so many areas of life. I mean, look at, I mean, it's the largest unemployment in the history of this country after we were just prior to the virus. It was like doing better than it's done in, you know, it was unbelievable. It was like the lowest it's been. It's gone from the lowest to the highest. It's kind of like what happened to my team, the Warriors. They went from the penthouse to the outhouse this past (laughs) season. (laughs) They sure did, man. But look at how, how it all happened. KD, he, he, he left it on the line for you guys, though. Would you agree, man? No, no. He's entitled to go wherever he wanted to go. I just don't understand why he would not want – I would pay and give up part of my salary to be on the Warriors team that was good that they had. Yeah. I mean, it was like the most ideal situation you could possibly imagine and why he decided to leave. And I finally found out recently what it was. I mean, he was upset about the Draymond Green situation, and he didn't feel that he was really appreciated or whatever. I – I, I, and he's entitled to feel that way. And I am, I, I wish him all the best and all. I just, you know, I root against him only when they play the Warriors. Otherwise, I am totally grateful. I got to meet him. I, in fact, I have a picture to show people how big he is that he just dwarfs me with a super, with his trophy. You know, he, right. I'm so small standing next to him. He's a seven footer for God's sakes. And he, and he plays like he's six foot six or five. I mean, it's, it's crazy how good he is. And it's just a shame because they had everything in the world. I mean, you went to a team where a two-time MVP was willing to take a subservient role. It didn't care if you were going to be the star. Mm-hmm. And, and you've got, you know, I mean, one of the greatest, the greatest shooting backcourt from distance in the history of the game, from distance. I mean, there's been some other great backcourts in the old days, but not to be able to shoot from three-point range like he and Clay can do, Steph and Clay. And then you've got, you know, you've got Draymond, who's, who's, who's kind of nutty and everything. But the Bulls had Dennis Rodman, so the Warriors have Draymond Green. I mean, and he's not to the extreme that Dennis was off the court, right. thank God. I mean, but <laughs> he's still such a vital part of that team. But to be there and to have to play the kind of basketball, I told people when he first made the move and they were all upset with him for leaving, he said, look, this guy gave everything to Oklahoma City. I mean, come on. He deserves to go wherever he wants to go to try to get a championship. It wasn't about money. And – I said, but he's going to find that he's going to enjoy basketball more than he's ever enjoyed it before. He's going to get more opportunities, easier shots. It's going to be more fun for him to play. And look what happens. I mean, he was a two-time MVP, and had he not got hurt in the series last year, he probably would have been a three-time MVP the way that he was playing. And so why would you want to leave a situation like that with great fans? As you guys know, the fans in, in the Bay Area are great. They're going into an unbelievable new building back into the city. I mean, it was like everything was falling into place. And then Clay gets hurt, and then he decides to leave, and then Steph gets hurt at the start of the season. I mean, it was like everything that could go wrong went wrong. It was like Murphy's Law. It was crazy. And you know, they'll, they'll still be a good team next year. They got a you know, draft pick, and they've got a, a, a cap exception and all. So they'll be able to put some people together. But they will not have a dominant type of team like they had before. And to be on a team that had a chance to be – Oh, they already were one of the greatest teams in the history of the league. That five-year run they had is better than any five-year run that any team's had. Right. But he had a chance to be maybe the greatest team in the history of the league mm-hmm. and to win multiple championships with everything I just talked about as part of it. Why would you leave to go someplace to go back? And he doesn't like scrutiny. He doesn't like being in the public eye and stuff. He's going back to the media capital. If he thinks it's bad yeah. in the Bay Area, man, wait till he experiences what's going to happen to him when he starts playing in New York. Yeah. I mean, he's in for a rude awakening there. I wish him well because I really, re- I really appreciate what he did for the team and the championships he brought, and I love watching him play. He's a unique player. He falls into the category of guys that I call anomalies. Guys who, are, who play their position differently than anybody's ever played it before. You know, Russell did that with the way that he played. Wilt did it with the way that he played. Shaq did it the way he played. All three of those guys were different, okay? All three of those guys were different. The only thing similar more, more of the power and strength between Shaq and Wilt, but more power for Shaq than for Wilt as far as the size and all. And then you look at guys like Charles Barkley, who was an anomaly, to do what he did at his size. I mean, Charles playing, he was playing power forward. A lot how tall was, how tall, how tall is Maybe 6'5 or 6. Oh, okay, 6'6. Six, six, six. Oh, okay. Maybe 6'6, six, six. yeah, maybe 6'6. Six, six. You know, Steph is an anomaly. Steph, nobody's ever played the point guard position the way Steph has played it, the way he Nobody. shoots their stuff. And then KD. I mean, nobody's been like, and then LeBron, nobody was been like LeBron before. Nobody's been like KD with his build and the things that he does. So there are those types of players out there. And now you got another guy, you know, Giannis is another one that's, you know, doing things. Olajuwon was another one. I mean, so when you, when you, when you just look and study the game, there are those players who fall to me in that category that they're unique in the way that they play the game. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
and you was one of the first, right? You guys, your team was one of the first to win this, uh, the championship for Golden State Warriors, right? Well, it's the first one that they won out in the Bay Area, yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. who was on that team with you? Uh, well, we had uh, starting guard, which, uh, we had Charles Johnson and Butch Beard, who were, or Butch was the point guard, Charles was the two guard. I played the three. Jamal Wilkes, skinny little Jamal Wilkes was the what? four. Clifford Ray was the five. And yet we were one of the top rebounding teams in the league. I mean, we were not big. Clifford's only 6'9". I was six, you know, six seven and a half, six eight with my shoes on. Jamal was only like <laughs> six seven. You know, skinny Jamal and skinny me. I mean, yet we did well. And George Johnson was the backup center, and it was like a tandem center. I mean, George was more finesse, blocking shots and stuff, whereas Clifford was physical and playing great defense and block shots and rebound. And then we had just great bench coming in. We had Charles Dudley came in to replace, uh, you know, Butch Beard and do it. We had uh, uh, we had also uh, Derek Dickey in the forward position who did a great job coming off the bench for us. We picked up Bill Bridges later, an experienced guy, mainly for the Chicago series to, to guard uh, Bob Love. And, uh, and he did a nice job for us in, in doing that. And so, I mean, we just had a lot of, you know, a lot of great people who were role players and, and did what they needed to do to help us win. And we, we played like a team is supposed to play, you know, sacrifice and do the things that you need to do to, to win. And nobody cared about who got it done as long as it got done. And right. it, was, it was my most enjoyable season that I've ever had playing basketball because we, we were like a family. Everybody cared about one another. And it was the way I always was taught that the game should be played. And it's the biggest upset in the history of the NBA Finals. I mean, nobody, nobody picked us to even make the playoffs that year. So right. not only do we make the playoffs, <laughs> we, 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 we wind up winning the Western Conference, and then we wind up sweeping the team that's supposed to be, that was supposed to be the biggest mismatch in the history of the NBA Finals. Boston. They said, this is the biggest mismatch. The Bullets are going to sweep the Warriors. Oh. They have no chance whatsoever. And we swept the team that's supposed to sweep us. So I defy anybody to find a team that was as big an underdog at the start of the season to do what we did. And yet nobody did anything. No documentary ever done about it. Nobody's paid any attention to it. It's one of the most overlooked accomplishments in all of the major sports in this country. Seriously. Wow. And, and I feel badly because, I mean, I got recognition. I was MVP of the championship series. But my teammates didn't get the recognition they deserve. If you go back in any sport and find any sport, they, oh, they the Jets in football, Super Bowl, bullshit. The Jets were picked to be a great team in the AFL. They just upset the Packers, which nobody thought they were going to be able to do. But it wasn't anything comparable to what we did. And then they say, oh, the Miracle Mets. Yeah, but the Miracle Mets were not picked to be a team that couldn't even make the playoffs. And wow. it wasn't like they went and swept in the playoffs. So, so there is nothing in the major sports that has ever taken place in the three major sports you know, I don't know hockey all that well, so I can't speak to that. But I don't think that's right. ever happened either. Wow! Uh, well, you got we got we got to make that happen, dear man. Wow, Just, we got to get that out there. What well, uh, was Kevin Porter from Chicago was on the floor, right? You remember that guy? Kevin Porter was on that team, and so they had they had Wes Unsel, Elvin Hayes, Truck Robinson, Mike Reardon, uh, Phil Chenier. They had. Um, let me see who else was on that team. Well, Nick Weatherspoon was another player on that team. They had Clem Haskins on that team. They were uh, they, loaded. They all, huh? But y'all swept. Haskin, wow. What's that? I said, so you, you all swept them. Then. They swept them. Okay, go ahead, Liv. What were you saying? I'm sorry. Yeah, well, they yeah we 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 swept them. We they they were so confident and overconfident. It was a joke because they. It's the only time in the history, I think, of the finals that they played the first game at home, and then we came back and played two at ours and then went back to their place because we had a conflict with the arena because they didn't expect us to even be in the playoffs. So our Oakland Coliseum Arena, was the, uh, the ice capades, I think, were there. So we had to go back and play our games back in the Cow Palace where I used to play in my first couple of years in the league. And uh, I love that because I love the baskets at the Cow Palace. I used to call them sewer pipes. They didn't have collapsible <laughs> rims back then. Usually the rims were really tight. But the baskets over there, I love those baskets. I said, you know, those are sewer pipes, man. You get it up there, and it'll suck it right in. I love playing. <laughs> and I had two, I had two big games. I think I scored thirty six or thirty seven, whatever, in those games in the Cow Palace. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a rat hole, but other than that, it was it was uh, good baskets. So, and I know you doing some other stuff too, uh, Rick. Uh, I know you have a. Don't you have a shoe or something like that? No, no, I have a podcast like you guys do on the same network. Yeah. Here. Warriors oh, 24. okay. Yeah. Warriors 24. I do it with the guy who was a former producer of mine when I did radio work for KMBR in San Francisco. It's called Warriors okay. 24. And so we do it whenever we feel like doing it. We've been, we were doing it once a week. And, you know, now with all this craziness going on, you know, uh, you know, it just, just depends. So 
it's kind of fun. We don't, we, we focus on the warriors, but not that much because they're so bad. It's, you know, how much can you talk about them? <laughs> so we, we talk about a lot of the other things that are going on in the NBA and just, you know, have a good time, a good time doing it. And, you know, started to have, you know, have a few guests and stuff on to do it, some writers or what have you, but it's, I love talking basketball. It's, it's, it's been great to me. It's been an amazing, it's been amazing um, life for me. I mean, with, I mean, to have, you know, five boys to all be professional, you know, basketball players. It's pretty remarkable. And my wife for my youngest son was an only woman. In fact, my wife, and it was really cool. My son played a game when he was at college of Charleston, they played in Charleston and, uh, and, and, but then he got, then he transferred to Florida for his last year to get his master. He, my son has his master's in nuclear engineering. Oh. And so uh, we played in Miami, my alma mater, and then they played up at Florida. And so my son got an opportunity to go down and, uh, no, actually, no, he wasn't at Florida when they did it. I'm trying to think of that. Was it Florida? No, anyway, whatever it is. He played, he played a home, he played in the home arena where up in, no, it was Charleston. I take it back because we played at William and Mary when he was in that conference. So they played at William and Mary where his mother's jersey's retired. She's the only woman to have her jersey retired. She was an All-America, academic All-America player. And then he also played in the same season down in Miami where I was, my jersey was hanging. Yep. And so it was pretty wow. remarkable. Yeah, that does, I mean, I think it's the only time that's ever happened. And, and, and then also in the only time in the history of the NCAA Division I men and women, my wife was an academic All-America two times first team and my son was a two-time academic all-america first team and also was the academic all-america player of the year in his last year and so that's another good trivia question there's a lot of trivia questions yeah you. man we got five minutes left so we don't want to leave nothing out man is there anything else you want to keep going because this thing i don't want this thing to shut you out man you got nothing but greatness around the house rick yeah, well, my wife, when I first was dating her and everything, we were up in Kutcher's and we went out to shoot some baskets and stuff, and she was kicking my butt in around the world. I don't know if you ever played that. And uh, and I said to her, no, no, you can't win. You have to shoot from NBA three-point distance in order to beat me. I'm an NBA player. Thank God they put the three-point shot in, otherwise I would have been ho toast. And he was a little out of her range, and I was able to finally get a little hot, and I came back and finally beat her. <laughs> but she she had me down big time. So yeah, she's she's a great athlete. She's uh, she's amazing. She's a great tennis player, pickleball player. She's uh, she's won in two of the places we are club championships for women in golf. And she's a great athlete. Now, now Rick, you now Rick, you are from athlete. New Jersey, right? Yeah, I was born in Elizabeth. Yeah, yep. went to high now, school. Now, how did you part. how did you get from New Jersey? being recruited all the way to Miami. Uh, well, because I wanted to get as far away from the Northeast as I could. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rat race up there. And there's too many people and the weather sucks in the winter. And it's like, I mean, so I wanted to get out of there and, and I got recruited, uh, I guess one of the coaches of a local Catholic school named Buzzy Fox, a guy who was a coach there was friends with the coach at the university of Miami and told him about me. And so he came up and you know, he saw me play. I never visited the school. Never. Just saw pictures. No, I didn't visit the school. I only visited one school. I had like 35 scholarships. And back in those days, I didn't do it. I went and visited Wake Forest because my father wanted to go down and visit a friend who was living down there in that area. In Carolina. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, actually, uh, when I went down there, um, Billy Packer was, was down there and part of the team and all. And so I, I saw the team. I didn't particularly like the living arrangements they had. You stayed in a room. You had to go down the hall to a master bathroom. Down in Miami, you had, had, you stayed on campus and we had a, a two bedroom apartment with a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, two bedrooms, and it was right on campus. And so that was much more appealing. Plus I liked the style of play. They were independent. So I was going to travel and play around the country. And I just love, I, I had to like my coach and I loved the coach down there and we played pro style basketball. Hey guys, in my senior year in college, we averaged 99 in a game with no three point shot. Wow. Look at that. 99 wow. with no three point shot. Wow. I had guards on my team. I had three players, a forward named Wayne Bechter, two guards, Junior G and Rick Jones. When they crossed half court, they thought they were in range. <laughs> they could shoot the hell out of it. I'm serious. And yeah, and we played up and down, up and down, fast break. And so for me, it was like having, it was like being in school, like having four years and you couldn't play a varsity as a freshman then, but we, it's like having four years of minor league play, playing NBA style basketball. That's why when I came into the league, I was one of the few players, I don't know how many have actually done it, few players who come into the league as a rookie and make first team all pro. 
Wow. Wow. <laughs> Rick, well, we got three minutes left. You, I don't want to lay nothing out. No, no, no. You can, Marcus, you can relate to this. It was easier for me to play in the NBA than it was in college. Why? Because in college, the other team, the old, they were old. The whole off the defense was geared towards stopping me, boxing ones, whatever, double teams, stuff like that. I went to the NBA. I had one guy guarding me. Said, oh my God! Open this court. Is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. <laughs> so, Rick, man, anything you want to leave with our listeners? We got a lot of basketball players that listen. listen here's to our the thing: show. if you if you're a young person listening, you're doing stuff, and you get married, and you have a kid, teach them the fundamentals of the game. Do them a favor. That's what you got: fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. Stress to him the importance of getting an education because if, if he doesn't have the talent and skill to, to have the chance to go and play in the NBA and make multi millions of dollars, he's got to have something else to fall back on. So you got to have an education. So education has to be number one. Then the sport that you want to play could be number two. Put the girls back, at least on the third burner. And then, you know, and, and, and learn the fundamentals of whatever it is you're going to do and find something you have a love and a passion for. Don't do it because you think it's a good thing to do. Do it because you love it. Wow. Find a passion because if you have a passion in life and that's what you specialize in and you can really excel in it, you're going to get paid to do what you love to do. And I tell kids, that's not work. When that's you right. get to do what you love to do, you don't have a job and boy, life becomes so much more enjoyable. And I wish him all the best with that. Good to Appreciate talk to you guys. I wish you well with your podcast. And uh, I'm seeing you got some really fancy ass equipment there with those mics and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? I know, Bill, they didn't send me any of that. Here's, I have my own headset that I have on the side. This is my this is my thing on the side that I had here. And I have I have a little. That's it. And I have a little box like this. Little box. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything very expensive. Here's. And here's my little thing that I have. Here's my little, here's my little mic that I have. It's like, you, know, you guys are first class. Lucky. Anyway, Rick, listen, man. God bless all of you. Stay healthy. And uh, the game has been great. Obviously, Marcus, it was great to you and your life. Same for me. And, and Robert, I know you're a big fan. Obviously, you love yourself with all the jerseys you have in the back. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, well, Rick, man, it was a pleasure, man, having you on here, man. You're a true legend. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on and joining us, man. Hey, happy to do that. Nice to see you. And glad that life is, that life is treating you well. All right, guys. Thanks, Thanks, man. Bye -bye, all ball Chicago. Bye -bye. We out of here, y'all. Rick Berry in the all building. Right, Peace.